Hello everyone, today we talk about Mughal artillery between the 16th and the 1st half of the 17th century. This is actually our last uh, Mughal uh, arms uh, chapter of my uh, specific modern warfare uh, cycle, uh, which hopefully uh, at some point we'll, we'll finish will take really a long time uh, if I can keep also going on um, and my random number generator more often than not for some odd reason brought me on Mughal warfare um, as opposed to all the early modern ones that just I could pick I hardly ever talk about the Spanish the Empire the French uh, and it, it's well even other we talk a lot about the Ottomans but say the Safavids or you know uh, we, we covered Poland, that is true, that was actually coming more frequently in the beginning, we'll see, uh, we will surely come back on Mughal warfare, I've seen that the audience is, is somehow interested, I've kept uh, getting views from from these videos, and of course we can always make some more in-depth ones on kind of less general topics. So we talk about artillery, in fact, and um, we have to observe, first of all, the comparison between the West and uh, the Ottomans when discussing the uh, the Mughals, because this would become essentially the second largest um, artillery um, uh, power, uh, of, uh, at least in the Islamic world, after the Ottomans, right? Uh, and it manifested an interest uh, an interest in in in, in such arm from quite an early time. Paradoxically, the Central Asian Timurids that came to India um, and conquered it had more uh, firepower, right, in terms of gunpowder technology, including artillery, than the Hindus, right, that had maintained a somehow more chivalric warfare. And again, it's not to be given for granted, because also Central Asia is usually represented as, you know, in, in the wake of the Mongol tradition, as, you know, they didn't like very much uh, firearms in the first place. The Tartars uh, mocked the gunners, said that, they st uh, that their stench was like the one of the devil, because of the sulfur uh, and everything. However, if you look actually at what they did, they, they began to, to adopt it in cons considerable measure. And the reason why um, the, the Mughals eventually um, developed it further in India is, however, obviously connected with the potential that the subcontinent have in terms of, you know, the grafting this technology in a more consistent fashion. Um, Europe was actually more advanced um, than the, these areas as it actually mastered since the beginning of European firearms, Iron Road, um, product you know pieces of production uh which were introduced in the early Mughal era only right so mostly bronze existed there were some yes there were some iron pieces but they were not done as well as the Europeans uh used um and and it seems of course from from their from their sources that the the Mughals estimated uh, Ottoman artillery uh, a lot but not just the one um, of uh, let's say the the ethnic core land, let's say of the, of the empire, was essentially the, the the Byzantine one, so Rumelia and Anatolia, because the sources talk about Rumistan altogether. Um, so talking about properly the empire of the Ottomans, and this included uh, at at least from the beginning of the 16th century, Syria, Egypt, Palestine. So. The territories that had been of the Mamluks that through the Red Sea, the Indian Ocean had considerable connections with India and that from that were uh, together the, uh, with the Venetians actually the, the most updated technological uh, power in you know in in Mediterranean and that having been in contact in fact with the the Indians for, because of geographical reasons of cultural ones etc had been uniquely renowned for uh, this this R, right? So, of course, towards the early modern age, no updated modern sanitary civilization could go on without firearms. We There is also an interesting chapter regarding the um, 
the contact the Indians had had with the Chinese because there were surely some Chinese ships that um, arrived up to Africa at some point and you know they they passed uh, along the, the Indian coast uh, in the uh, station in the Indian ports they were surely equipped with guns uh, at some point however the main influence was definitely um, Western and the most important inj injection as far as at least the, polluted, the imperial power of the Mughals was concerned came from Central Asia. Now during the early 16th century um, the Portuguese that were uh, beginning to to colonize uh, the region noted that the Mughals possessed very large guns already. Right? This is as we'll see typical of the Mughals especially in later times where large guns were just a way of saying you know look at you know how big it, uh, I ha I can't get one even though they, they were dysfunctional because of course they they had a ridiculous uh, shooting um, uh, rate and the you know they, they caused a disproportional amount for the rest however the Mughals had also very um, uh, say a, a very multiform as we will see now array of of guns uh, some of which also uh, procured some Western uh, inventions, for example, uh, the Napoleonic rockets the British uh, fielded at times uh, in European uh, on European battlefields were a legacy of their Indian colonialism. Um, and we'll talk about it uh, in a while. You know that um, rockets were there in Chinese Mongol warfare, right? That, that at least as far as the as far as China was concerned had to do with a mm, with a bias towards kind of more incendiary devices than explosive ones, right? Europeans made immediately kind of a, a much more explosive use of, um, you know, of firearms with greater amount of um, of saltpeter, uh, whereas the Chinese were, say, took took a longer time to, to develop that, specifically as Europeans did. We, that there are ways, um, even though they, they are credited with the invention of, of gunpowder and its military use, that actually they, they did since the very beginning uh, as well. Um, we'll talk about that on another occasion. Um, in in general, this this slight bias seems to have occurred also in, in India for some reason, at least comparatively to the West, right? Uh, and especially to the Ottomans that were from again from a from a Western perspective were kind of Easterners, but if you look at them from from the East, uh, it, they were basically you know the, the Westernest possible thing, right? In terms of a quasi pike and shot warfare and definitely an impressive amount of gunnery um, at so many levels. And made videos about Ottoman artillery, by the way. The Portuguese, the aforementioned Portuguese of the 16th century, also noted that the Indian bronze cannon were superior to those of iron, and this has to do partly, of course, with the uh, with the qualities of the alloy that, as you know, has initially is, is actually more refined. It's much more um, gifted as far as uh, guns, but also arms in, in many ways. Um, Except iron can be, um, you know, worked much more cheaply by a degree. Depends really what you have to do with that. Generally speaking, uh, uh, the Indian um, guns were primarily bronze at this point, and definitely better than the iron ones, also because of this kind of stagnant iron, wrought iron specifically technology in India existing uh, uh, at the time, still. Among the Mughals, many types of artillery were already in use, including the Firinji, that were called this, this European light field guns, the Zarbzan, that were operated only by two men, and the smallest, the Tufang matchlocks. Remember that, uh, say, muskets also it evolved fundamentally from from light artillery types historically right and they were pretty bulky things um, by the way in fact evolving from from that just technology making gradually kind of more efficient smaller whatever but uh, originating differently from the harkabus from light uh, in fact mobile highly mobile uh, artillery mostly um, 
told it just by 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 arm. Babur the Conqueror's heaviest weapon uh, seems to have been a mortar with the range of 1600 paces. Some years later, Humayun's army was said to include 700 light cannon pulled by bullocks as, as well as 21 heavy guns. We're talking about essentially the, the early mid 16th uh, century. Um, at this point, uh, Mughal artillery was just famous in India because it would be able to outshoot the Hindu rockets and was aided by these aforementioned Firinjis. Um, so, foreign guns, um, probably hand firearms mostly, right? There's nothing uh, necessarily specific about that. That could have come consistently from. Uh, from the West as well, so again, um, not just a Central Asian contribution, but um, a blend, right? But also with Western uh, guns of sorts that naturally could have been um, properly European technology at some point, but still something that could have been adopted as such as somehow, um, if not standard, at least like common ones by say the, the Ottomans, right? In between the word the Safavids as well, there were a bit more chivalric bias, so they they didn't adopt um, uh, firearms so quickly, at least until the uh, the disaster of Caldiran against against the the Ottoman firepower. Under Akbar, that ruled from 1556 to 1605, one of the most famous Mughal uh, rulers, there were great advances. In artillery, Akbar is credited properly with the greatest kind of uh, development of firearms uh, in India, in a in a functional way, right throughout all uh, Mughal Mughal history. Um, and uh, this made the Mughal Empire, in fact, alongside the Ottoman Empire, the leading Islamic state in terms of gunnery. Uh, Akbar set up new factories and was sent to test all the new guns by by himself which was just like a kind of a mix of political interest and kind of genuine personal one let's put it this way um, it seems that the emperor was particularly keen on matchlocks of which he understood the potential mostly as the you know as any ruler in India can do in order to arm large amounts of lower subjects, because the, the greater problem are naturally always the, the noblemen, right? So having in this kind of renaissance warfare a finally kind of an extra technological help to kind of counter the, you know, the, the, the fame, the, the traditional Indian cavalry by these kind of uh, commoners equipped with, with, uh, with firearms provided by the state case the Mughals had a significant amount of centralization for for the time standards always difficult with India but still could it could really do right Akbar is credited to have been uh, a fine shot himself so that he trained with guns he's also believed to have invented new guns himself which is say unlikely say that these technologies may have been in uh, in the air already and he just kind of dedicated himself to, to their perfectioning and, and, and so on. Specifically, guns that could be dismantled on the march, weapons with 17 barrels could be fired, a single match. Um, also a guy now, heavy musket employed specifically for elephant back use, and even an oxen powered, say, wheel which could clean 17 matchlock barrels at a time, right? Um, so you understand that this early modern India artillery, um, though important in sieges, played also a secondary part in, in battle. There were different um, types of guns that were quite effective for a, in fact, an early uh, open field uh, employment supporting the other arms. Um, Regarding the tactics employed, we know that they would, that this this guns would be placed mostly in, in front of the army center, 
where they could only fire before the main forces joined battle. Right, so a bit like in the case of, of, of the Turks, the Mughals um, uh, employed um, guns quite dynamically, sometimes in fact exposing them just in front of, um, as we'll see now, in front of, uh, of their own lines to, to, to ambush the enemy, right? Creating a screen of lighter forces, then open it to just shoot on the incoming cavalry, especially. Um, and uh, as a consequence, uh, uh, the Mughals used, just like the Ottomans and other, and, and also from the Central Asian tradition, to chain their guns together, right? So preventing their um, simple kind of, uh, you know, exportation from the field, let's, let's put it in this way, given that this warfare there was also a lot of cavalry or of oh, this mounting unit, so quite uh, quite dynamic one, uh, which could even say, I don't know, take control of one cannon, beginning to 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 to, to turn it, to move it uh, against the you know the same owners during the same battle. Uh, naturally, uh, natural cover or field defenses were used to protect the guns especially in this case from, from light cavalry that was just uh, could be effective just against the crews that generally speaking weren't quite much of a you know fighting uh, fighting units per se they were somehow vulnerable right especially to all these kind of darts projectiles of, of all kind flying all over in the first lines right however this tactic again of specifically tricking the enemy Right, attracting him, especially in the center, where um, also because of these uh, fortifications, etc., the the guns could be concealed, and suddenly, you know, creating chambers of, of death, right, uh, trajectories, enfilade fire, all of this thing. When the enemy had come within, at close range, by the way, which must have been horrifying, uh, given as we've seen this set of I don't know guns with 17 barrels all shooting at once re really you know could make uh, a dramatic shock effect it could severely uh, hamper the uh, the enemy attack right from the 16th century we have as we've said the evidence for ponderous pieces muggle employee uh, we have less data about this kind of smaller guns but we'll also illustrate better because there are some sub Typologies, um, and we we see that the largest pieces were being drawn by oxen, some requiring a team of even 120, right? And uh, these pieces were so large, by the way, in spite of the oxen pulling them uh, from the front, there were also uh, elephants, uh, specifically trained to push from the rear with their leather padded foreheads right so increasing um, as much as possible um, the you know the the effect of all the all the elements uh, of the army um, during the later Mughal period an improved ox drawn gun cart known as the uh, Rakala uh, appeared before which these large guns seem to have been rigidly mounted on solid wheeled carriages uh, even during the, the 17th century when probably the, the peak of Mughal artillery was reached under Aurangzeb mostly however in the second half of the century that we do not take in consideration. It's worth mentioning though because at the time um, uh, the you know, the, especially the the selling of albeit inferior pieces of European arms um, uh, was in uh, in India was was quite consistent, right? So they adapted just even the uh, the carriages uh, the way they they originally had done, also because probably the pieces they bought on average were were, were smaller, right? And what um, saying less sophisticated than what uh, Europe was already beginning to produce right in any case as I was saying at the beginning the later Mughal rulers had this obsession for 
very big bronze cannons that were also somehow more more traditional and there were some also heavy decorations on them primarily designed to impress the enemy just for, for the splendor of them but not necessarily for their their actual destructiveness right uh, the uh, artillery's rate of fire throughout the entire period remained fundamentally uh, very slow right um, in part this must be understood given the nature of the other arms of um, Indian forces that we've seen again ahead there is a playlist of Mughal warfare you can look at everything is more still uh, chivalric by Western standards more feudal by Western standards so also as, as we know technology per se is never alone uh, the size of and it's nor it, it is meant to be so there was substantially a more primitive technological background and, and availability in, in the first place whenever such um, vector technologies could have been acquired anyhow like an ordinary cannon would shoot something like four uh, times in an hour right the, the, the this giant guns fired in full efficiency one shot every 45 minutes the uh, size however of some siege guns was very great together with still that their functionality generally speaking were very large fortresses that required uh, such firepower right in the 30s of the 17th century for example Sha uh, Jean had a pair of 17 foot 90 pounders they were nicknamed uh, as you know, uh, unstandardized uh, pieces of, of the largest dimensions always were historically uh, with particular um, uh, next like uh, blessed victory and world conqueror, right? So, as you understand, also a pretty traditional kind of uh, vocabulary about the universal empire. Um, in any case, throughout the world period, exactly because of the great weight of, of these major pieces there were lots of, of smaller ones right especially by the mid 17th century a lighter more mobile artillery force had uh, been sighting uh, the heavier pieces counting 70 in number in the imperial army at the time this was in fact called the artillery of the stirrup because um, it was in constant attendance upon the emperor's person, specifically, thus providing some kind of um, dynamism and you know quick reaction to threat coming on the battlefield, as you understand mostly, to the imperial um, station. It consisted of 50 or 60 small bronze uh, field pieces, drawn not by oxen, but by a pair of horses to each gun, so they were also, in fact, lighter uh, and more quickly uh, deployable. Each well mounted on a painted carriage with two ammunition chests uh, attached, one before and one behind. Um, we know from their ornaments that they had red streamers, and at least judging from later art, uh, the... Mm, model of the decoration was essentially patterned like a red hand some kind of the I don't know the, the crewmen were uh, had it, their their hands uh, soaked in blood because of the amount of losses they could inflict to the enemy but I'm not sure this is the correct uh, explanation the first time in Indian history in which uh, the artillery was organized into a separate unit within the Imperial Army was under Babur, so we are probably at the beginning, which, which shows again how much that kind of Central Asian background was still quite uh, receptive and open to a modern update uh, of artillery, um, which also brought uh, cannon and their gunners uh, remaining, as we've seen also with the with for Akbar's interest in. in firearms in the first place um, under strict 
statal control and properly as a department of the imperial household right there was the, a great deal of also of literature properly illustrating how Mughal power derived in great part also from this um, part of their army how ideological this this um, uh, really the the superiority of uh, that this was very felt in India because of the cases and all the traditional view of these kind of um, instrument was just to control from an Islamic background also the, the the majority of of the country and this household was commanded by a senior officer known as the Mir e Atish or Daruga e Tubkana that over the centuries um, became a very powerful uh, political figure as well. Um, under him, uh, the artillery officers were divided into the same mansab ranks as we have seen for the Islamic cavalry and that were appointed by the same emperor. Well, each unit was led by uh, an Hadzari. What is also interesting about the early uh, modern uh, Indian artillery is that most master gunners were Ottoman Turks in origin. There were also Arabs, Indians, Portuguese, Dutchmen. Uh, over time, as we've seen it, the West began to 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 increase uh, in, in relevance as far as India as far as the military technologies were were concerned and uh, by the way by the, the mid 17th century European mercenary artillery men um, had a very high status within the Mughal uh, forces in fact one Dutch gunner is known to have served India uh, for 16 years before returning home a rich man Right, which was happening also in the Ottoman Empire, also because after the end of the Thirty Years' War, there had been a, an overproduction crisis. The Westerners began to, to sell at, at cheaper prices a lot of unspent uh, military uh, equipment. Also, the Dutch were just you know um, roaming around India more than, than than other people, and they had emerged uh, successfully from 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 the, the, the aforementioned conflict. Um, so, lots of things definitely uh, make sense. This, this um, systems, lo local systems, wouldn't be able to compete at a point. The 18th century India fell in the hands of, of the British, uh, and this surely derived from in fact the, the different pace of military development. Generally speaking, it's a it's obviously a political matter. But when we look at these other branches, also technology itself, we can assess how the aforementioned spheres naturally were mirrored at, uh, down the down the ladder. So um, the uh, the necessity of importing Western technology also reflects the the general political incapacity of uh, you know funding uh, unequal. Um, Say type of you know in, in, inventors that locally would have mostly lacked the uh, the induct the components etc that just barely a you know a centralized system however in a country that was still relatively backward could could not provide um, in in the first place um, one interesting feature of Mughal artillery uh, that we were uh, remembering before were rockets, right? There was the Banandas, a rocket corps, uh, specifically uh, in the in the Imperial Army. Probably rockets were already in use in India, not just uh, before the you know the full kind of affirmation we can see in in in, in the military organization on, under the sun, right? But from you know, substantial uh, Central Asian influence of some sort. Just they had not been developed in a quite quite a uh, apparent way 
uh, up to that time. Uh, rockets consisted of an iron tube up to 3 inches in diameter, it's about a foot long, tied with row height to 6 to 12 foot bamboo. It could carry an explosive hand uh, or sword blade up to almost one kilometer in range. As you understand, the rockets were not very reliable, to say the least. However, its doctrine of employment could compensate for this. Because, first of all, um, th yes, they were not precision weapons, but at medium-short range, um, even if, again, quite erratic and unreliable, they could hit uh, with a good degree of, um, you know, of predictability, large bodies of troops, especially cavalry, given also that horses are kind of a bigger target, albeit the preferred tactic against um, against horses and some rockets at least were specifically designed for, um, to, you know, to, to, to follow such a trajectory was making them skimming and uh, make the, the rocket skim at kind of ground level right near uh, at the heights of the same um, horse's leg so again it was not even important to hit them just to to throw them into chaos these projectiles naturally unnerved the elephants as well so generally speaking creating chaos right as, as a as a valid doctrine important was just to um, point the rockets in the more or less if you know the right direction and they could make this this mess falling falling all, all, all around um, another advantage is that the rocket was much easier to transport than guns projectiles and this is why um, this weapon had been so popular also among the the I don't know the Mongols other steps people because a camel mounted rocket man for example could carry as much as 10 rockets um, and although um, the there were you know issues regarding for example you know where to 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 lit them right that you normally they used a tripod or something um, in fact as it would be done also later on in, in British service right uh, and but but even at this point uh, the launching of, of the rocket didn't require much of an apparatus in, in the first place it was simply uh, light it light the fuse and then throw the rocket in in any direction right it could be partially dangerous of course but and, and highly imprecise but if you consider how again easy it was to carry like if you consider the firepower it can put together with large amounts of troops and how easy it is to to, to bring one right um, you could really create a very high volume of fire then of course you could explode for some reason but <laughs> in the process but um, arquebusiers and musketeers weren't having such great fun at the same time because if the bandolier coat fire would simply you know explode and was also the risk if you uh, didn't distance the ranks um, enough that this would cause uh, devastating domino effects among your uh, missile lines, right? So um, it was a risky business, but it could do, right? Not too much in terms of precision or even damage, but still much psychologically could unnerve, especially this great amount of mounted troops. Um, um, and um, rocket sticks were also often decorated with small penna while being carried, so there was some uh, some care for for these weapons uh, in the first place. And this is definitely like a Central Asian legacy of some sort. This is what the Timurids brought um, to India. Furthermore, as we were remembering before, such legacy went on from the subcontinent to the British Army where an officer named Congreve um, uh, got the idea from literally seeing uh, the rockets used in India in 1806 uh, to um, develop uh, his own just 
marginally improved version of uh, such weapons to be used against uh, the Napoleonic forces uh, in the old continent. Right, it wasn't much of a game changer, but you can appreciate the fact that you know at least the British were getting some ideas also from uh, regarding something profitably applicable in Western doctrine from their various uh, colonies uh, at that point. Speaking of smaller firearms, um, as we've seen, there were the bigger guns, the kind of the lighter ones, still kind of meant as artillery, then there were kind of smaller pieces as well of different types. In the Mughal army we see two types of matchlock um, in size fundamentally. The standard barrel being about four feet long, the larger six feet. Um, the Damka and the Ramja Naki were instead uh, some sort of steel field gun, you had the Argon uh, multi-barreled weapon. They came in, again, pretty uh, unstandard pieces uh, that could be of different dimensions and serving different, substantially different tactical purposes. The troops known as Bundukches were armed with matchlocks like uh, European calibers at this point. Uh, the aforementioned Jezail was um, a longer sniping weapon, by the way, because it would be called Jezail later, right? But if you look at this early times, uh, we're in parallel with the, the Ottoman siege of Malta and such things when Europeans documented that Turkish snipers had these um, significantly long and accurate um, weapons which could hit pretty easily. Uh, you know, at 70 meters on the ramparts, uh, etc. It, it was something belong a bit to, to those backgrounds. Um, the, uh, you know, also in India, naturally, this, this, this was developed uh, in some way. Uh, there is to stress, however, that the, this is not um, necessarily, um, you know, it, 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 it shows, uh, of course, an important development in firearms. However, mostly, and this is typical of the East in general, with not with a completely pike and shot capability. Mostly shot, right? And these powers mostly all lacking the equivalent, at least, of the um, pike squares used uh, in in the West, right? So mostly developing this kind of kind of nastier firearms because. They partially counted on them. In this case, also, it's just the snipers, right? They would try to take out uh, the officers, etc. These were primitive sniping guns, but they made sense in that direction. Um, other Mughal fire weapons included the Gabara mortar, or its bomb, the Dag mortar, um, the Uka i Atish, some of which allegedly being able to shoot like uh, projectiles of hundreds. Of kilos, including large earthenware grenades. Um, the handy clay grenade was thrown by a sling instead, so we're still kind of catapults, of course, employing explosive uh, projectiles. Um, the, the sling was known as chadar. Then um, the, there were also bundles of inflammable uh, materials used. Some incendiary devices still used as some sort of, um, you know, uh, spring gals, right, with incendiary stuff uh, tied around a uh, an arrow, something of, of uh, in metal. The band rockets that that we have seen, so a pretty wide uh, assortment that uh, reflects well, kind of the polymorphic and uh, enormous uh, kind of Indian background that was in fact elephantically uh, put together by the by the Mughal uh, by the imperial forces uh, in fact so this is more or less the picture right you have a you know all, all the range possible uh, firearms development that again puts Mughal India uh, up air slightly under the Ottoman Empire in terms of firearms development you know that 
the Ottomans dominated de facto the the early modern age uh, as they invented essentially the, the two most important um, uh, you know uh, era making inventions were the granulation of power that allows essentially a much quicker burn of the um, you know of the powder because there is you know the 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 grains are round so there is oxygen within them it's easier to ignite the entire thing more rapidly concentrate um, more powerful explosions within um, uh, also the same the same space uh, that modified guns accordingly but still was more effective and the bayonet which was which was opening actually to to the phase of western dominance as a matter of fact so so it's interesting that Mughal India still had an important degree of uh, kind of, again it's a subcontinent right so the idea that politically there was you know powerful somewhat centralized north right in the Indo-Gangetic plains and then you had a, a surrounding world in part the Central Asian one the northwestern frontier because in the north you have the Himalaya fundamentally and so these kind of connections that the Mughals maintained with, say, controlling Afghanistan, from the, which they had come from uh, originally, then having to cope with the southern kingdoms that were also opening um, to to the Europeans, um, and that were also, they had their particular warfare styles, we've seen it in the other uh, videos about Mughal warfare, that technically, however, is taking in consideration also something of the southern traditions that as you know were wilder they had um kind of less technology but somehow that more more aggressive tactics as far as at least as you know just strategically mostly you know especially at the beginning of the period they had less um you know uh, offensiveness uh, in the first place so you find these um kind of uh, archaisms next to really even within the most developed areas right to the some of the most updated technologies naturally we're not overbearingly documented again uh, uh for generally speaking for eastern history uh especially compared to the west and in fact we, we rely also importantly on, on western sources but if you get in the details at some point we can also try to do that uh, regarding, I don't know, the Safavid. The, there is a lot of Persian sources, for example, talking about India, interestingly enough. It's also the connections with the Ottomans, you know, there was a general alliance between the Christians and the Safavids against the, the Mughals and the Ottomans, right, just by proximity. Um, and all these had, um, again, a, a deep, important effect, right, just like in the Ottoman armies, you, you could find Indian troops, as a matter of fact, yes, there were Indian troops serving in Europe against uh, the, the the Western Christendoms. Um, uh, I used the plural unavoidably with the Reformation at this time. Um, in the Ottoman army, right, uh, from, from India. So it, it's, it's fascinating because those connections existed with colonialism, as we've seen the Portuguese, the Dutch began to, to open... Also, the, uh, the the properly the Indian Ocean route, and also simply circumnavigating the globe at a point. So th there were increasing um, uh, contacts with the Indian uh, powers that eventually led, you know, to the most of the take European takeover in the 18th century. Um, as I said at the beginning, we can easily go in depth with certain other issues also strictly technical ones other more tactical or doctrinal whatever um for today however we conclude with this video bit the, the cycle on the mughals so we'll pass to someone else more likely in the, the next time we look at early modern warfare so i'm glad just completing uh this this chapter kind of looking at it and saying yes there, there is a moment which we can say you know there's an end point and you pass to another thing because it means you're covering topics and we're completing so so again all everything is stored in the Mughal warfare playlist there is an Indian warfare playlist that will create plenty of others as I add also further say content that can 
help categorizing better certain aspects. Um, for today, however, I stop it here. Just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.